Welcome again to Don't Call It Magic. We're all magical people in the Caribbean and its diaspora, but what do the entanglements of magic, myth, folklore, history, culture, liming, bacchanal, all have in common? I think they're rooted in words, and it's my great pleasure to be moderating this panel with three of some of the finest wordsmiths and word makers I know. My name is Shivani Ramdochan. I'm a member of the NGC Bocas Lit Fest team, and I am delighted to be joined by Karen Lord, Pauline Melville, and in a few short minutes, Ayanna Lloyd Van Woo. Before Ayanna gets here, because she's facing the particular magic that is delayed buses, <laughs> allow me to introduce Karen and Pauline. Karen Lord is the author of the prize-winning Redemption in Indigo, the speculative fiction novels The Best of All Possible Worlds and The Galaxy Game, and the crime fantasy novel Unraveling. And because you're a special audience here at Bocas UK, I'm delighted to whisper to you that Karen's forthcoming book, The Blue Beautiful World, will be with us in summer 2023. Please give her a round of applause. Thank you. Next to Karen is Pauline, whose Master of Chaos by Sandstone Press, published in 2021, is the latest short story collection from the acclaimed Guyanese British writer. Pauline's work has won numerous literary awards and has been translated into 10 languages. Of the Master of Chaos, Salman Rushdie, you might have heard of him, says, in this virtuoso performance, Pauline Melville shows us a world in upheaval and reminds us that that's where we live. I'm contemplating introducing Ayana before she's on stage. <laughs> and I think I will not. What I'll do is introduce her when she arrives. But first, invite Karen to share a brief reading from Unraveling with us. Thank you so much, Giovanni. So um, whenever I read from speculative fiction, there's always a lot of context that you feel you might have to give so people are not totally lost. Fortunately, this is a bit that doesn't require a lot of context. We're talking about the characters being in a labyrinth. Hi. Well done. <laughs> no one noticed that, right? I've been here all along. <laughs> Part of the theme. <laughs> Go ahead and, no? you sure? Yes. Okay. You have come just in time to start my reading. So the labyrinth, the purpose of this labyrinth is to give the protagonist a, a possible future view. And the two characters who are going to be speaking in this conversation, neither of them are human. And that's all the context I'll give you for now. You'll have to hear the rest. Multiple human shadows. How do you do it? The trickster marveled. Patience closed the door. It has to be done. Everything in the labyrinth is me. Except for what goes in of its own free will, the trickster guessed. Patience gave him a silent nod of confirmation. But dear Patience, I've had so many doubts about you and your love of free will that your mastery of puppetry does not appease my concerns. She sat down on the ground without grace, as if suddenly exhausted. Shall I tell you how I achieved this high skill? The trickster dropped down beside her. He choked back his yes, sensing that the knowledge would be both unpleasant and impossible to forget. But it was too late. She leaned forward, demanding his full attention with an intent gaze. Every path I dreaded to take, every weakness I rejected, even the joyous passions that threatened to overwhelm me. In sum, every part of me that I could not control, I set apart from myself. I gave my wild selves their own incarnations and pushed them out to work their will in the space and time allotted to them. 
I have whittled myself down piece by piece in pain and in bliss until what remains is my core of iron, molten and compressed under the burden of all my ifs and maybes. The trickster had no answer but silence. She straightened, taken away some of the force of her presence and spoke more gently. I am sorry, my love, myself. We cannot escape responsibility for our decisions, even when we want to be persuaded that someone else is to blame for that final yes. That is as true for you as it is for me. I know how free is the will that I gave you, and yet I am also responsible for your actions. How shall we live out this paradox? Unshadowed and true, she rose to her feet. The world is my labyrinth, and everything in it is me, except for what enters of its own free will. Free will, he began, uncertain of his own query. Free will is a game, only a game, but a necessary game. The greater my power, the more care I take to honor its rules. She bowed her head. The trickster was still unable to speak, but he had to make some effort to convey the awe and concern he felt for her. Crouched on the ground, he too bowed his head. He reached out his hands to her warm, dusty feet and touched them softly like a small child reassuring himself of his mother's presence and attention. Go back to the labyrinth, was all she said, but the gentleness of her tone comforted him. So that's one small part of unraveling, and I have another small part to share with you um, that again is dealing with one non-human person, but another who is human and who happens to be his mother. Chance went down the road to the old family house, the place his grandfather had built, the place where his mother had grown up. The village was deep asleep at this hour, with only the occasional barking dog or restless yard fowl to punctuate the relentless chirp of the tree frogs and crickets. It was of human eyes that he saw that the three steps of the veranda were occupied. Palma was sitting there, her form relaxed and unworried, propping her chin sleepily on her fist. She looked up as he approached and shifted aside so he could pass, but instead he sat beside her and gazed up at the stars shining in the spaces between the leaves of the trees. I love you, Ma, he said. Unexpectedly, Palma laughed. What does love feel like to you, she wondered. Chance sighed, but he was smiling too. This will be hard to explain. You can tell me anything, she reminded him. He eyed her in the dim light. Her face, as always, gave nothing away. Very well. I can feel the spaces where the threads will go, the threads that will weave your life and mine together. If I haven't lived it yet, it feels like a lack, as if I'm missing something very important, missing someone who's very close. Every encounter we have takes away the space that makes me miss you and replaces it with a cord that links me to you and you to me. Loving you when I haven't yet lived our times together feels yearning and unfinished. Loving you with all our moments accomplished feels sweet, strong, and complete. When you put it like that, said Palma, her eyes shining of tears and pride, why would anyone fear death? Certainly not I, mother, he whispered fondly, nudging her shoulder with his. She sighed as she patted him on the arm. I was worried about you. I should have known better. Now go to bed. It's late. He squeezed a quick hug around her shoulders, got up and went inside. Just past the threshold, he paused, shook his head and laughed a little at his own forgetfulness. He spoke over his shoulder. We'll talk in the morning, Ma. I have a journey in mind for you. The last thread has been woven, and it's time you met Miranda. She turned her head suddenly to face him, eyes wide in mock excitement. No more vagueness. I will find out who she is. You will tell me how you first met. 
Chance nodded. I will tell you how I first met her, years ago, in the city, sitting on a bench in the shade. And after that, since you know me so well, I will tell you the other story about how she first met me. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. We'll now hear from Pauline, who will read for us from The Ventriloquist Tale. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? I don't trust this small thing I've got <laughs> pinned to my ear. You can hear? Good, OK. Um, I've chosen to read a, a little bit, well, two little bits from The Ventriloquist Tale, because it's mainly set in an area that you're probably less familiar with, which is in the far south of Guyana on the border of Brazil amongst the um, Wapishana, Makushi, and Waiwai peoples. Uh, and I think a lot of people in the Caribbean aren't so familiar with that. It's a different culture, really. Um, the narrator of the, the novel is a Makushi uh, folk spirit called Makunaima. And I'm, uh, I'm going to read just a, a little bit of his introduction to the novel. Spite impels me to relate that my biographer, the noted Brazilian, Senor Mario Andrade, got it wrong when he consigned me to the skies in such a slapdash and cavalier manner. I suppose he thought I would lie forever amongst the stars, gossiping as we South American Indians usually do in our hammocks at night. But first, I lay claim to the position of narrator in this novel. Yes, me. Rumbustious, irrepressible, adorable me. I have black hair, bronze skin, and I would look wonderful in a cream suit with a silk handkerchief. Cigars, yes. Dark glasses, yes. Except that I do not wish to be mistaken for a gangster. <laughs> But dark glasses are appropriate. My name translated means one who works in the dark. Mm. You can call me Chico. It's my brother's name, name, but so what? Where I come from, it's not done to give your real name too easily. A black felt fedora hat, worn, tipped forwards, possibly. A fast driving BMW when I'm in London, a Porsche for New York, a Range Rover to drive, or a helicopter when I am flying over the endless savanna and bush of my own region. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, and I like to smell sweet. I like to rub myself in every orifice and crevice and nook and cranny with lotions, potions, balsam and creams. Why am I not the hero, you ask? Because these days, you all have forgotten how to make heroes. Your heroes and heroines are slaves to time. They don't excite wonder and amazement. They don't even attempt to astonish, enchant, or amuse. They've forgotten how to be playful and have no appetite for adventure. Sub-zero heroes, a puny bunch embedded in history, or worse, psychology that wrinkle in the field of knowledge that hopefully will soon be ironed out, leaving us in our proper place between the monkey and the stars. Believe in me, I am the one who can dig time's grave. Mm. <laughs> oh, I was just going to do another little bit. Hang on, there's another little bit to that. <laughs> um, I invite you to my homeland, the parched savannas that belong to the Indians either side of the Kanaku Mountains north of the Amazon, the plains where it is said people have so little that a poor man's dog has to lean against the wall and brace itself in order to muster the strength to bark. <laughs> That's all for now, folks. The narrator must appear to vanish. I gone. <laughs> God, this, sorry, there was one little bit. Shall I read a bit more? What's the time? One little bit. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Uh, one little bit. Yeah. I'm just going to read you 
one little bit, because again, it relates to the theme of this session. Um, and it's about um, Danny, who is being trained to hunt by Shibidin. Gradually, Shibidin unraveled for him the complex tangle of stars in the sky, until Danny thoroughly understood which stars indicated which season. Everything has its master in the stars, explained Shibidin. Everything that moves, that is. You don't find plants and trees in the sky because they have roots and they can't move. He pointed out certain constellations. That's the master of fish. That constellation signals the rains and tells you when it's fish breeding time. The little group of stars at the top we call the tapir. The tapir is also connected to the rainy season. You've heard people say, shoot a tapir and rain soon come. They're numerous around the time of the rains. He pointed out the topmost star of the Southern Cross. When that top star reaches the highest point, then you'll hear the poet's bird cry, that grunting cough. It cries at a different time every night, but always when that star is at its height. Danny soaked up all the knowledge. He learned that each constellation was a being who used to live on Earth and had gone up to the sky to avoid persecution and to be in charge of a particular creature. Soon he could tell by the stars when laba or bush hog would be plentiful, when the high grasses or the thunder maize were likely to seed, when the frogs would start to sing and the fish spawn. He could distinguish the scorpion rainfall from the crab rainfall and predict when the black swallows would come twittering from the caves and rivers, darkening the sky as they dived after the swarm of insects. Mm. Right. <laughs> Is that short enough? <laughs> Thank you, Pauline. I, for one, would love to hear you read the entire book. Yeah. Then, <laughs> then where would we be? Somewhere great, actually. Not a bad idea. Ayana Lloyd Banwu is the Trinidadian author of the highly acclaimed novel, When We Were Birds, published by Hamish Hamilton. Excellent. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Which The Observer named as one of the best debut novels of 2022. She is a creative writing PhD candidate at UEA, and very recently, Ayana was shortlisted for the £20,000 Eccles Centre and Hay Festival Writers Award, mm. which I think deserves a round of applause, don't you? I don't know why Shivani trying to get me kidnapped in this go over season. <laughs> <coming> up here. <laughs> Ayana, over to you. Thank you. Um, I, I, you know, amongst, um, notice she didn't say that she was excellent at timekeeping and navigating buses and directions <laughs> and so on in that, um, in that intro. You know, me and London buses have a long-standing battle, but here we are. <laughs> I'm going to read a, um, a bit from Yejide's section of this novel. The novel goes back and forth between Darwin and Yejide, who are our our main characters and our, our lovers that meet in a cemetery, very Kitchener-esque. Um, and um, this section is when Yejide has just inherited her mother's, her matriarchal power to see death. So she sees people in a very different way than, um, than we all do. And her mother has just died. So the house is in just, you know, if, if you can imagine that moment when the house has been in vigil <coughs> and then the death has come and now everything is sort of hushed and wondering sort of what's next. Mm. And then the moths come. Tiny white cotton whispers that settle in your GD hair, on the curtains, on Petronella armchair, on the banister winding up the stairs. Big brown ones that fly straight at you when you're trying to walk. Open a cupboard and they fly out like a small army. Get it in the teacups when you're trying to make tea. Sitting on the kettle until just before it boil. Then they scatter and fly to the bulbs, the lampshades, the light outside on the porch, casting shadows on the windows. They gather in the walking gallery on the flaking portraits of Mama, Deborah with her laughing mouth, broad nose and upturned eyes, baby girl, her face round like a small moon, her hair wiry and frizzy and near bursting out from under the pattern fabric of her head wrap. 
They gather on the photographs of houses that no one alive could even identify. Big ones with turrets and demerara windows, small slim ones with ornate black gates. Other kinds of moths, black with white spots and a purple line running across their wingspan, big like bats, settle only in Petronella's room, on her white shrouded body, on the wardrobe, on the sideboard. They plaster the windows and block out the sun so the rooms stay in dusk light, even after the rain stop and the sky brighten. They come to see a mother home, Peter tell her, as he brush one from his shoulder. He reach up and pull up a tiny white moth from Yejide hair and smile. This time Yejide could barely recognize her own self. Every time she pass a mirror, she see her eyes glassy and wide with dark circles under them. Her hair spring out every which way and the white fluttering moths make her a tree in bloom. She find it hard to look at people straight on now, so she stare just past them. Everybody in the house like they split in two. She can see the Peter that she had always known, a strong, kind man who had never left their side, always looking younger than his years, the silent backbone of the house. But she could see something else now, a shadow around his body, his age, the old man he would become. Wasn't as simple as seeing his death, but she could see the time that it would come to claim him, see it around Seema too, even more so around Agatha and Angie, Mr. Homer, the darkest of them all. She wondered if this is how her mother had seen everybody. Her mother, her mother's mother, her mother's mother before that. Their gift, their curse. They all give her a wider berth now as they pad around each other in the house, waiting for the ambulance from the funeral home. They can't take her wild eyes or her fixed gaze, and she can't take the look on their face when they see her either. She finds that if she stands very still, almost forget to breathe, she could look on at them as they go on about their tasks and they can't see her at all. Not invisible, just still. Like she become part of the house, part of the air, existing in a dimension separate from where everyone else lives in. When that wasn't enough, she sneak out the house like she and Seema used to when they was young. She don't take Seema, don't even tell her, can't bear the idea of anybody holding her hand. And later, when the outside feels too big, like she might drift away in it, she sits on Granny Catherine's chair in the corner by the front window and watch Seema gather seasoning from the garden. Just once, Seema look up and toward the house, like if she feels somebody watching her, but she never gave no indication that she see Yejide at all. And Yejide head so full that she wonder if it might not be better so. When night come, she lock her door before she go to sleep. And still she can't get the man out of her head, the green man amongst the dead. Who was he? Only light around him, nothing else. Light and forest and green and something strong and pulsing that draw her to him. How she traveled there to see him wasn't something she could ask Peter about. You can't tell your father, well, the man who was as good as your father, that you see a man somewhere in a dream and you know you have business with him and he have business with you. Last night, after the whole house going to sleep, she sneaked downstairs and sit in Petronella's chair for hours, waiting, hoping, trying to squint her eyes to make the garden look the way it had looked after the vigil, to somehow bring her mother back to her, to ask her the questions that only she would know the answer to. But it seemed like they only get one shot, one chance to say whatever else needed saying, and that time gone. The ambulance drive up the hill and pull in front of the house. Three men get out, but the driver take one look at Yejide, standing on the porch, her hair covered in wings, moths all over the windows, even in the daylight, and get right back in the ambulance. Not me and them devil thing, he shouts and lock the door. <laughs> Thank you, Ayana, Pauline, and Karen for those readings. As you will have heard, 
each of these books and, and larger bodies of work by these three writers entangles myth and history in captivating ways, but also interrogates with mischief, with humor, with pecong and wit, what it means to be from a magical place. My first question to all of you, answer all at once, is <laughs> have you ever felt like a magical being while writing? Ooh, all right, just, <laughs> just give me it later. <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> I can only answer that by saying that if madness is magical, yes. Because when the yeah. characters are having loud conversations in your head that you didn't think about in advance, it does feel a little bit strange. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, no. You should I've never felt like, like, that. like a magical being. No, I just feel like a worker. <laughs> Right. Uh, maybe my head goes here and there, but I, I don't feel myself that I've transformed into some kind of zombie <laughs> <laughs> at all. I think sometimes it, late at night when you're, I think I've scared myself sometimes when it was just too late and I should have been asleep mm -hmm. and I've had too much gin and I, I really should have been asleep. It's like the third day of Bender mm. and you know, you kind of have that Am I here? Am I somewhere else? Am I? It's just, but that's probably just caffeine and sleep deprivation <laughs> more than anything I've else. I've heard that caffeine but is a kind of magic. A kind of magic. <laughs> yeah. I wrote a collection of stories once called The Migration of Ghosts. And actually the stories bore not much relation to the title, but I kept the title because I had a period when I was frightened that not only might we migrate, but those spirits might migrate with us mm. and uh, I had this idea that um, Moongazer, I don't know if that's just in Guyana, is it? Mm, Moongazer, yeah, no, mm. so it's huge, it's, it's about the size of Big Ben mm. and it straddles the crossroads. Ah oh, yes, you know? big tall legs. Big yeah. tall mm. legs straddle the crossroads, crossroads. you can't walk through the and legs. talk through the legs mm. but it doesn't mind if you're smoking a cigarette. Oh. And, uh, and it, it gets bigger as the moon get, gets bigger and it diminishes as the moon. And I thought, my God, I mean, supposing that was in London. Mm. Um, <laughs> and then later on, I began to think, no, those, I think those sorts of creatures are quite territorial. They stay where they belong. Mm. Because you wouldn't like see Anne Boleyn, who was beheaded with yeah. her head under arm walking in the bush in Guyana. No, she wouldn't <laughs> want to get there. <laughs> you know, so and I um, reckon we cross we're, water, as somebody's just we're kind there. of safe, probably. probably. If there are any spirits in attendance with us today, I hope you're kind and benevolent ones. <laughs> but, but as the panel is proposing, magicalness, the state of being mm. special and otherworldly is ascribed often to Caribbean writers when Book reviews emerge in prominent papers or publications outside of the Caribbean. There's often a sense of, we don't know what to call this thing, so let's call it magical, magical realism. realism. But as Ayan and I have said many times, <laughs> magical realism in Trinidad and Tobago is just what happens when you walk down the road sometimes, <laughs> or buy groceries, or, mm -hmm. or feed your family, or mm -hmm. go to carnival. Yes. Mm -hmm. and speaking of carnival, Ayana, mm -hmm. I know I had to talk to you about carnival because <laughs> As you described recently effusively in a panel here, there is a myth making and a map making to Carnival that mm. every Trinidadian and Barbadian and Guyanese person can understand. Mm. How do you felt you accessed elements of the Carnival-esque in One mm. Birds, which ostensibly doesn't take place during Carnival, yeah. but there's mass running through the blood of the book. Mm. I mean, there, I think that there are so many ways that um, we are, we are mask-making people, not just mask-making people. I mean, um, whether we are talking about this from the masks that we wear to get through <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis, as we do, whether we mask our language, whether we mask our, our, our culture, whatever it is, as, you know, as a way of, of navigating spaces you know, like, like this, <laughs> whether we mask to make ourselves invisible to allow ancestors to come through us 
in the rituals of Juve, in the rituals of, of, of Orisha, spirituality at, at feasts and so on. I think we are, we are mask making people. And I think one of the things that was interesting for me in writing this book was the idea of making yourself invisible or being invisible and being something else. Um, the the, the, the St. Bernard woman, um, the part that I read um, from Yajide, her family is more or less unknown and invisible to everybody else in, 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 on this island except for those who live very close to them because their work necessitates secrecy. Mm. I mean, what are you going to do? Walk down the road and say, hi, I know exactly the moment you're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's not, that's not prudent, wise, or necessary. Mm. Um, so there, there is, I think I, I found the idea of, um, of taking on the guise of something that you're not for your own protection, for the protection of others, mm. for the ability to do sacred work that has to be done. I mean, all secret societies and sacred societies require a kind of invisibility, a kind of mask that needs to be worn in order for this work to take place. So, mm. and I think, um, and death is, the, is, is, death is sacred work. Mm -hmm. Working around death is sacred work. Burial is sacred work. Embalming is sacred work. Um, um, you know, funeral rites is sacred work. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the work that these, these women have to do necessitates a kind of mask, a kind of secrecy. And this is one of the parallels I found mm. evident in beautiful ways between When We Were Birds and Unraveling, because the world of Unraveling, as you'll know if you don't yet know, is densely labyrinthine. Mm. And there are people who walk through it who are both human and non-human, mm. angelic and less angelic. <laughs> and it's, it's a dense, rewarding novel that's so concerned with what we do in our lives that makes us worthy of living it. Or if we're less worthy, do we deserve to die in it? Mm. And walking those paths mm. felt truly important to understanding the heart of the book. And when you were writing, Karen, did you feel that you, as the creator, followed similar paths? Well, that's a good question because this book took 10 years to write. It's a sequel to Redemption, and I jumped into it even before Redemption was published. Mm -hmm. And why I had to write it is that the question that Redemption asks is an answer, and the question is, can you have redemption for um, those who are, in a way, living out of time, who have a different kind of approach to existence than we do? So there were writings, and there were rewritings, and there were dead ends, um, you know, you talk about a labyrinth. The labyrinth is the one that coils, but the maze is the one where you can come up on dead ends. And sometimes you thought you knew where the book was supposed to go, and it was like, nope, can't go any further here. So you had to backtrack and go again. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that in a way it had to take 10 years because there were experiences I had to have. There were people I had to lose. Mm -hmm. There were... Um, entire ways in which the world itself had to change, not even just myself, for me to be able to make sense out of what the book was supposed to be about. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's hard when you want to be a professional writer who just like cranks out a book every other year, but, but this, is, this is something that the book just teaches you by, in a way, yes, being its own labyrinth, being its own mode of self-reflection. Yeah. And we talked a little bit, Pauline, back there, and we were getting mic'd up about this responsibility we often face as Caribbean writers to keep hearkening to home, writing about a specific place, whether it's Guyana or Trinidad or the wide Sargasso Sea. And the master of chaos, in really virtuosic ways, doesn't do that. It rebels against the idea that Caribbean writers can only tell specific stories. It travels. A lot of these short stories are global. They occur in far-flung, parts of the world, did that feel the process of writing it to be centered in a kind of rootlessness? What was the process of voyaging like? Well, I, I am quite rootless. <laughs> mm. and, um, and to be honest, I don't want to belong anywhere. Mm. <laughs> uh, as, soon as, I, um, as soon as I feel that I belong somewhere, I want to escape. Mm. And I did, want to, I did want to show that Caribbean writers can write about anywhere. Mm. 
Yep. You know, we don't always have to... I think probably there's something that informs the work that comes through. Um, but, um, yes, I really wanted to try... I, I've written in that collection some stories set in Russia, Suriname, Syria, where I have never been. Mm. But I think, I think one of the things is that, that is underestimated is the imagination. I mean, because we don't want to be trapped with the sociology of just our own backgrounds, our own history of where we, at least I don't want to. Yeah. I mean, every writer is different. They've got their own method. But I, I always want to explore something and um, sort of break walls. Uh, yeah, the, the master of chaos breaks all kinds of surfaces you would think were impenetrable. <laughs> and I think what, one of the things that's really remarkable about it is that it does that with a kind of irreverence and mischief that we could call very Caribbean. Mm -hmm. A lot of the figures in it are tricksters, they're little miniature Anansis, mm -hmm. and there's quite a bit of rebellion mm -hmm. happening, skittering just beneath the surface. Mm -hmm. And so in that vein, a question for the three of you, if everything we do as writers is composed of a certain kind of magic, mm -hmm. and we accept that folklore and myth are intrinsic to how we write, where do each of you find this in your practice? Do, do the sources <laughs> feel, do they feel distinctly Caribbean? Do they come from elsewhere? Are they out of this world? I'd I love to know. know. One thing I'd, I noticed, I don't know if any of you in the audience noticed that on the day, on the morning, the very morning that Rishi Sunuk went to Buckingham Palace to become the prime minister, something strange happened in the sky. Does anybody know what it was? A partial eclipse. Mm -hmm. So he's on his way to Buckingham Palace and there's a bite taken out of the sun. <laughs> so I noticed that immediately. Mm -hmm. and, and then I thought, oh my God. I thought, by the time he's finished, his, <laughs> be a full. <laughs> his sun will be gone. The whole sun will be gone and we'll be living in a grey austerity. Um, so, I mean, that's how I, my mind works, really. Um, Looking uh, for omens and portents. <laughs> portents, yeah. I'm, I'm depressed now, is anybody? <laughs> um, I think that... Oh God, now, now I study eclipse, I study in... I study, okay. um, I think I pulled from, because I grew up reading all kinds of fairy tales and all kinds of stuff from everywhere, mm -hmm. I just think it's my birthright to take what I want yes. from wherever. I agree, you know, I feel like I should and, you know, I mean, all you done, I don't get take from one place and carry a next place, well, I might as well <laughs> make use of every story, every myth, every fairy tale, every whatever. So, like, in the... In the, the when We Were Birds begins with a, a, creation, a creation story that a grandmother is telling her granddaughter. And she's, she tells about how the Kobo came into the world and how death came into the world. Now, there is no, um, there's no myth anywhere or no fairy tale or anything that I found that tells that story. But there are countless stories about Kobos, about carrion birds, about ravens, about vultures. So I, I just kind of dove into all of them. Yeah, and I would do the same. That's the same. what I wanted yeah. to create this, this narrative that I needed because, you know, I, it, 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 it's there and it all belongs to me. So I, I think I, I could, I could teeth. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I agree. Um, and in an earlier panel, um, Jacob says something that struck me talking about the topography of the human heart yes. being this, the same yeah. all over the world. Mm -hmm. And folklore strikes me like that. Whenever you're reading folklore from whatever region, there is this really, really strong echo where you're like, well, that sounds like that and that sounds yes. like that. So, you know, as you say, you know, you're not really stealing. It's, it's, it still feels like yours. Yes. It's talking about this more baseline human condition. But another place that I take mine from is um, when I was an undergrad, I was studying um, history of science and technology. And the fascinating thing is when you look at these periods of history where people were like, this is a science. We have right. rules. And then you look back and it's like, wow, you guys just like made some stuff up. <laughs> 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 So, you know, and then on the flip side of that, there are things that are, um, you know, depending on which 
again, culture or region you come from, are portrayed as magic of ritual, and then science sort of comes in and says, oh, well, actually, that herb really does do that, and this mm -hmm. particular ritual really does do that, and we have a grounding for it. Mm -hmm. So when you recognize there's that lovely blur between the, the heart of the science and the, the soft or the magic or whatever, it's just fun to keep crossing that mm -hmm. border over and over again. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that's why, you know, we keep having that thing about, the, you know, the, the panel, don't call it magic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, for, for, for you might be magic, for me that's science. For one might be folklore, for me that's history. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, it, it, it's, 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 I understand why we need those, those categories. I suppose, you, I'm sure you would agree. You know, publishers and critics, they have their work to do. Marketers. L the marketers, they, yeah. let them do their work. But <laughs> as, as creators, that's not our work. Yeah, <laughs> to sit down and no. say, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's this real, it's magical realism. Blah. And also sometimes, the, uh, like the ventriloquist tale is really about um, the coincidence of, a, of science, Einstein and the theory of relativity and how it was finally proved, and a myth, a South American mm. Indian, particularly myth, of um, a brother and sister coming together during an eclipse. Mm -hmm. And that mm. actually happened. There was actually a true story in mm. Guyana of a brother and sister who went just in the area where the eclipse was showing at that time, and it was all recorded by a Jesuit priest who went to try and break them up. And th that coincidence of the science and the myth both predicting mm -hmm. something at the same time is sort of interesting to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you've learned here at Vocus UK 2022 that a writer with bad manners is the best kind of writer. <laughs> Always give them permission to steal whatever they would like and say thank from you anywhere. For from, from anywhere, including from right here in the British Library. <laughs> oh, I plan to. I hope to. <laughs> Karen beautifully said in 2016, when something real but traumatic or taboo occurs and it cannot be spoken of directly, it finds expression in parable or folklore. Mm -hmm. Tell the truth, but tell it slant. Mm. What's been the advantage to, to each of you of telling the truth slant, as often we've been made to do? Mm. Historically, we've often been made to come through the side entrance, the mm. servants' quarters, the indentured passage, mm. rather than the grand colonial front door. Mm. This kind of access as writers, what has it given you? Or what has it taken away? Mm. Do you know, sometimes it feels almost more like playing. Mm -hmm. Because mm. if you tell something factually, which I've had to do because I have a, a side life as a you know, socioeconomic academic, and ac academics as socioeconomic research, there's, there's more of a challenge to telling it slant. So yes, on the one hand, you are maybe processing trauma, pr processing grief, finding a way to tell things to people that allows them to face it in a way that a hard fact wouldn't. Mm. But it's also, it's also, there's a, there's a knack to it, there's a skill to it, and, and you're constantly challenging yourself to see how many different ways can I tell this one truth, mm -hmm. and how many different people can I reach with those different ways. Mm -hmm. You know, when I, um, so I, I decided to, to make Port of Spain, Port Angeles in this novel. I created a, a city that was Port of Spain, that wasn't, but was not Port of Spain at the same time. And every now and again, I think about it and I say, who am I kidding? Of course it's Port of Spain. Like, why did I, why did I bother? But I think why, why, why I bothered or why I felt it was necessary to do that is I think I had so much anxiety about getting it wrong. You know, I had just left um, Trinidad to do this Emmy. And because I had never left Trinidad before, I, and I'd grown up in Trinidad, I'd grown up in town my whole, whole big 37 years before I, I left. And I, yet I still had this fear that I was going to forget something, that when I was trying to write the city, it would be the wrong way, or the thing that was here was actually there. And I got so kind of tied up in that anxiety of, was I going to tell? And you know, trainees, you tell something <laughs> wrong. Listen, they will pelt ripe mango at you. They will bad talk you all over Facebook, <laughs> whatever. So I said, look, let me make up, let me make up my little, <laughs> my little place so if I get it wrong. <laughs> nobody can say it's not that. But what it did, it kind of freed me from having to say it is this or it is that. It meant I could make, I could make the city as big as it needed to be. I could bring mountains up close, close, close. I could make it so dense that a man could pick up 
drive from south to north and like nobody ever see him again because he could disappear, which sounds like it's impossible to happen on an island, but people really just disappear mm -hmm. and you never see them again. But, you know, I think being able to kind of tell Port of Spain slant made me, gave me the ability to write it. Maybe it's how it feels like to me, mm -hmm. rather than if I had to, if you looked at it on a map, you would say, but this place is small, mm -hmm. how it could be so whatever. But mm -hmm. if, I, if I could write it through what it feels like, and in that kind of slant, then I can write it truer for what I needed it to be for the, for the book. Whereas if I, if I sat down and, you know, maybe sat with a map and sat with a thing and <laughs> figured out what was there, it would be kind of drier, at least for me, to do it that way. Yes. I, mm -hmm. I, I, my real worry is that sometimes I write about real people. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm frightened that they're going to read it and recognize <laughs> themselves. <laughs> So I always <laughs> sort of add other attributes. Yeah. So that they, but, but I mean, I don't do it that often, but I, but I have done it. And then I thought, well, I know this friend of mine's mother. She never reads a book. <laughs> so, <laughs> Steal her and I'm, her in I'm safe. I could put her in. But uh, that's one of my concerns. Mm. Yeah. Mm. But the back door is more fun too, Shivani. Just using the house image, you know, it means, I think it also lets you, um, I mean, the front door, a front access is, is what, you, what you show, right? What you say to the world, this is who I want you to see me as. Yeah. But when you walk through the alley of anywhere, that's where the workers, they're smoking a cigarette, talking, bad talking the boss, mm -hmm. and you walk through the back, you know, you get to see a whole different, yes. a different yes. part of things. It gives you a different way of approaching story that mightn't have good manners, mightn't yeah. be polite, mightn't be whatever, but could be more interesting. To, to, and the to more tidy something. it is, the more fun it is. The more tidy <laughs> it is, the better, the more fun. Mm. Yeah. I promise that the back entrance to this festival is very mannerly. It's organized, <laughs> with light, and they're following instructions. <laughs> so, so in that case, yes. It's been a delight to speak to each of you, but I won't let you escape until hearing a little bit more from each of you in reverse order. Mm, okay. And uh, oh God, reverse order. I mean, me. Hold on. <laughs> that, that would be a piano first. Well, relax. It's here. <laughs> reverse order. Um, oh, okay. So um, I will read from a little bit from Darwin's section. Darwin is um, is my other protagonist. His novel has two protagonists, and. Um, very quick backstory. Back Darwin was raised Rastafari in the country, comes to Port Angeles to seek his fortune, among other things, and finds the only work he can get is in a, in a graveyard as a grave digger, which challenges his whole, his whole sense of self in many ways. Some days, Darwin can't work out how long he in the city. The calendar say nearly two months, but Fidelis Fidelis is the name of the cemetery. But Fidelis have a different kind of time. The hours longer, the days deeper, and digging graves and lowering coffins in the ground is like watching whole lives fast forward beginning to end. Fidelis make him adopt its rhythm instead of his own. And it's not just Fidelis. Port Angeles crackle and spit like oil on a fireside, and he start to like how he could disappear into it. Just another one of the many somebodies that come here for whatever it is they come for. He learning that even death in Fidelis does work in sync with the city. Payday, that mean hospital, courthouse, and graveyard. Heavy rain, that mean road accident for so, and they're too busy to even laugh and old talk. Then it's have other times when something starts to ripple through the city. The wrong man get killed, the blocks get hot, and it's only sirens blaring out through the night. Them days they dig in grave three, four times a day and have to send for temporary workers so they could do more than one funeral same time. But now, as it get closer to November, around All Souls Day, it's like the dead and the living come to a kind of a truce. All the graves quiet, and sometimes he don't see the other grave diggers at all for a couple of days. He know they does work other jobs and get little contracts when things light, but nobody let Darwin in on the cuts. True, he could use the money, but he don't mind. The days when it was just him, 
even the weights of the keys in his pocket make him feel good. And when the street lamps come on, the outer edges of Fidelis Guild in borrowed lights, he stands at the crossroads, right at the center of the cemetery in near darkness, and feel his whole body relax, like how a man must feel when he finally reaches his own home after a long day and smell food cooking. Not like he ever know that feeling, but he figured it must feel a little bit like this, like Fidelis at twilight. Mm. Thank you. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to give you a little bit from the book that's coming out next summer. Yay! Um, yeah. That's a big deal. <laughs> So there, there, there are two little bits, one short and one slightly longer, but it's all a bit quite, quite short. In spite of the breeze, the, the waters beyond were calm, and Kanoa soon found himself in that smooth, steady swimming action which his father called strolling. Even breath, long stretch, relax into each surge and rise of every swell. So hypnotic, he almost found himself drifting off again into a kind of moving meditation. He almost forgot to listen for the parallel splash of his father's progress beside him, but it registered nonetheless as a strangeness, a distressing absence that shook him to full awareness. He stopped, alone, looked around, alone, looked back. His father was floating some 20 meters away, mercifully face up, and his lips pouting in labored breathing. Kanoa sprinted to close the distance and immediately positioned himself behind his father's head, one arm across his chest, supporting him and cradling him close. His father laughed weakly. A little discomfort, it'll pass. Then he turned his head to the side, convulsed and retched a little into the water. Kanoa gripped him more tightly as a swell washed over them. I've got you, Kanoa said, forcing all hint of fear from his voice as he raised his wrist to activate his emergency beacon. They'll come for us soon. Hang on. No, wait. His father's voice was soft and sleepy. His eyes were half closed, but he smiled. Don't stress. It's a good death. Can't complain. In that moment, Kanoa knew that he'd fallen asleep again or had never woken up and was dreaming about swimming at dawn with his father. Because at no time in the real world would his father be dying while the ocean surged around them. And only in a dream would the horizon grow higher like a rogue wave while the water around them turned gray and dark, yet mildly turbulent like waves over shoals. Only in a dream would the ocean stop behaving naturally and turn into a badly rendered VR mock-up something too bad to even be a placeholder mid-design. He did not panic. The brush of water against his skin, familiar as breathing, became a tickle of seaweed, then a numbing tingle that took away all chance of panic. His arms slackened, and his father's body slipped away from him. The gently churning waters parted them, and then he could not think or feel anything. And then, He's speaking to someone else about this experience. I only want one guess from you, Naraldi. What do you think happened to my father? Hmm, Naraldi murmured to himself. Well, that's not such a bad question. The answer is a bit long, unfortunately, but perhaps a bedtime story is exactly what you need. Kanoa turned over and around so that he was on his stomach, head towards Naraldi and the ocean. Tell me. Did your training in Havana give you any information on the origin of the Eridanian ships? Very little, Kanoa lied. He wanted to hear it all again. All of the human origin planets are related, although there are several hypotheses and no clear reason why this should be the case. Our oceans, land, and skies comprise a biosphere which is identical in some respects and merely similar in others. At times, there's a marked difference, some beast or plant beyond anything seen anywhere else in the known galaxy. The ships of Epsilon Eridani were categorized as such, and there are even more hypotheses to suggest that if they had not been a part of our evolution, we would have developed to be like the Austrinians or even the Lyrans. 
Our ships were intelligent leviathans whose origins and domain were the depths of the ocean. They might never have been discovered except for their own curiosity about the humans that dwelled on islands and coasts. They hungered for us and they consumed us in every sense. They became the center of myth and religion, the voices in our dreams, the sacrificial meat of our rituals, the resting place of our dead, and the resurrection thereafter. In time, science gave detail and logic to the wisdom of our ancestors, and we understood what it meant to join the collective consciousness and travel across the galaxy via dimensions previously unknown. Our religion became a journeying, and the paths we traveled became the roots of our empire. Okay, um, I'm going to read a little bit from the Master of Chaos, who was in fact a gambler. Um, but it's an example of the pure theft you're talking about. Ah, nice. Because for some yeah. reason, um, I gave him the attributes of Baron Samedi uh, mm, from uh, Vaudan, Vaudan yeah. from Haiti. Mm. And I don't know why, and it didn't matter if the reader didn't get the get it, mm -hmm. I got it in my head. So when I was writing that character, mm -hmm. uh, it informed m my feeling about him. Mm -hmm. Although, in fact, he dies after the second page. So, uh, <laughs> um, My grandfather was a gambler. He came from that generation of men in the old British Guyana who were graceful simulacra of the British gentleman, a charming, mocking shadow of the real thing. In that part of the world, the past sometimes succeeds in pushing the present out of the way. My grandfather was tall, slim, with a pale brown complexion the color of agate. He liked to wear dark glasses, even when it was raining, and kept a black silk opera hat that folded down into his suitcase. He smoked cigars, and of all the rum in the world, he preferred El Dorado, along with his favorite snack of grilled peanuts. He used to visit us in England, but never stayed long. Sometimes when he took off his sunglasses, I would catch his eye, and the twinkle in it confirmed an affinity between us. People observed that as I grew taller, I looked more and more like him. Occasionally, he took me with him when he gambled. I remember a damp room in Tottenham, where I looked on as his long-fingered brown hand unfurled like the wing of an archangel to cast the dice on the cheap veneer coffee table. His dice were unusual. They were light, knucklebone weight, and yellow ivory in color. He told me they were made from the bones of a gambling friend, an Amerindian man who died in the swampy interior of the Mazaruni River. He thought they brought him luck, as did a constellation to the upper left of Orion when it rose in the night sky. He pointed it out to me one night. The constellation of twins, Castor and Pollux, represented his birth sign, Gemini. But he told me that the Aztecs knew it as the constellation of the frog. The two bright stars that represented the twin's head in Western mythology became the two eyes of the frog for the Aztecs. He preferred the Aztec version. Are you superstitious, Grandpa? I asked. Only on Tuesdays, he replied. <laughs> Ayana, Pauline, and Karen, it has, I dare say, been magical <laughs> speaking to each of you. You will all want, I know, to voraciously get these books. If you don't have them yet, please make your way over to the bookseller's table, run by our project partners, Renaissance One, and get a copy. If you have copies for yourself, get one for your friend, get one for your enemy, get one for your favorite <laughs> ghost. And the writers will be around in a couple minutes to sign them for you. When you do that, come right back. We have a lot more festival left. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Shivani. Thank you, Shivani. <laughs>